Thanks everyone for being here today. Thanks for choosing the front end side instead of the back end side. Woo! <laughs> and uh, really thanks to the GS Day team for organizing such a lovely event in uh, Verona. My name is Luigi, also known as uh, Luruke on the web. And I'm currently working as a creative front end developer at APK Agency. I generally I'm focused on interaction and animations on the web. The main office is in Liège, Belgium, but I'm actually working remotely here in Italy, actually not far from here. And I think that the web should be a fun place. I think that the web should be less static, uh, more, less boring, more interactive and more playful. So that's kind of my mission and I do different things to hopefully achieve that. So one of the things I do is that uh, since last year I'm part of the jury on awards, which if you don't know it's a website and a word that recognizes the creativity on the web. You should check it out if you don't know it. Sometimes I try to write stuff or just to contribute to open source projects. And uh, two years ago I made this library uh, which is called Barba.js and I recently discovered that has been used by uh, Google and Taylor Swift. I don't know why. <laughs> so about today's topic, uh, WebGL. Uh, what is WebGL? Web WebGL is actually just a rasterization engine. It's just an API to draw stuff. Uh, it's a kind of, of API, a Canvas API, but much more powerful. There isn't much magic going on behind. And one thing that it's really important, WebGL is not 3D. Most people think that WebGL is uh, 3D on the web, but it's not like that. Uh, even if the API gives a lot of characteristics that helps using matrix, vectors, things that are really important for 3D, uh, we can also use WebGL to do just 2D. And it's really up to the developer implementing everything about camera, uh, lighting, which are things that belongs to the 3D world. And actually WebGL is just a porting of OpenGL for the web. Uh, those in yellow are the years when the specification has been made. And uh, we have WebGL 2 running on the Chrome and Firefox table since one year. And actually, as you can see, WebGL 1 is just the porting of OpenGL 2.0, which was, is a specification made in 2004. So even if right now we can do a lot of stuff on the web using WebGL, a lot of cool stuff, uh, we are much behind from modern desktop API like Metal or Vulkan. And the real power of WebGL lies into the programmable, programmable pipeline. So those are all the steps needed to show something on the screen. And uh, the two steps in orange are the ones we can modify as developer. And we can modify those steps with uh, something called shaders, which are little programs written in a GLSL, which is a subset language of C. And those steps run directly on the graphic card. So we can actually write code that runs on the graphic card, which is quite cool. So to give you an example, let's compare Canvas API with web WebGL. This is what we would do to draw um, a black square in Canvas. It's pretty simple. While in WebGL, it works a little bit different. There are no shame primitives. So everything needs to be done by hand. So we first set up our buffer geometry, let's say. Then we write our vertex shader, which is the little program that runs on the GPU that um, defines the position in space for each point. Uh, if you want to do 2D, we can just copy the values. In a real world application here, we would handle things like 3D perspective, camera, and then we move on to the fragment shader, which is the shader that is responsible for coloring the pixel. 
And in this case, we just use black color with one opacity. So most of the time, mainly in WebGL, we just have buffers and we use shader to draw those buffers. And the two buffer, the two shaders, vertex and fragment, actually they are compiled and linked together and they create a program. And tada, we get our, our black square. The reality is that uh, WebGL is a quite verbose API and you need around 200 lines of code to make that square. So um, you need a kind of abstraction layer when you do WebGL. And you can either using an existing framework like 3.js, Babylon.js, Pixie.js, even if it's just 2D, it does WebGL rendering. And how many of you ever tried WebGL, even just for a spinning cube? And how many of you tried 3.js for that? Okay, so 3.js right now, I think it's the most popular framework. Um, but there are also more minimal framework like NanoGL and Regal, which are cool. And of course, you can also write your own framework if you are brave enough. So in the last three years, um, I had a chance to work on different WebGL projects, smaller and bigger, uh, with different clients, different scope, experiment, personal stuff. So today, what I want to show you, I'm not going to talk about how WebGL works, because I think you can find a lot of resources online. What I'm going to show you, and hopefully will be interesting for you, what I learned during those three years. Uh, the mistake I made, performance optimization, and stuff like that. So everything started more or less three years ago with this picture. And it's uh, really funny for me because uh, one day a colleague of mine, a designer, uh, came to me and said, uh, hey Luigi, we're doing a pitch for a web game for Red Bull. Uh, we want to do a web game. Uh, our idea is a web game like this that is going to look like this. There will be three lanes. The user could jump from one lane to another, needs to grab some bonuses. There would be a DJ dancing. There would be music. There would be objects flying with lights and stuff. Can we do that? I was like, uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. And uh, I said, OK. I don't know because I said, OK. And I didn't know what I was going to do. I really hope that the client didn't like the idea because usually clients don't like your idea. So I said, okay, we'll start with this, then we'll probably we'll do something else. Uh, but the clients this time loved the idea. So I actually had to make it. And my skills in WebGL at the time were these, like this was the only thing I, I could do. So I had to do this game. I had like something like two or three months. And this was the final result. We have the DJ dancing. Okay, so this was the web game we launched and was working on desktop and mobile devices. But the funny thing is that this project, it never went online. Like three months of hard work, try and try again, performance problem, mobile problem, and never went online. So we tried to convince the client to actually uh, use it. So we kind of reskinned the game for another purpose. So at least uh, we used it somehow. So what I'm going to show you right now are 10 things that I learned over those three years. First thing, prototyping. It's really important. Um, I'm going to show you another example. This is a web promotional game we made for UPS last year. And it was super important doing prototypes. This was the final result. It's a, it's a game kind of uh, Candy Crush 
where you have to match parcels with houses, you have to make combos, uh, there are bonuses, and rounds on desktop and uh, mobile devices. And we really started with Blackboard and sketching because really was we also had to define the gameplay and was really important to create a game that not only was playable but also fun to play, not too hard, not too easy and those kind of settings are hard to balance and takes time. So we need uh, wireframes and also in WebGL it's different than CSS. If you want to change things later it's not so easy because you have to model 3D elements and stuff. So those are, what I'm going to show you right now are some, the development phase. What I did is just, I went in Git and I made some kind of snapshot in the development process. So as you can see, the main idea behind all the, the development process was to have something playable as soon as possible. So we could actually refine the gameplay, make it more enjoyable. And really, always hard start with the hardest thing. Even if at the beginning it's really ugly, uh, try to, uh, to focus on the essential things and then you can refine, adding texture, lights and stuff and you will able to spot performance issues or other issues, design issues, whatever. And really what I also learned is that Blender is not just for 3D artists. I had a chance to attend some uh, 3D generalist course and uh, it really proven to be super helpful for me as a developer. So I'm really encouraging you if you want to do 3D, try, uh, try to start from a, from a tool like Blender because you will get a lot of concepts that usually are hard to grasp. And Blender, it's uh, great for prototyping, it's an only one solution, modeling, texturing, it's open source, uh, there are exporters for 3.js and GLTF, which is a new web standard for, uh, it's not web standard, it's a new open standard for uh, 3D assets. You can build, you can write your own uh, plugin in Python and it's made by developers. And when I say made by developers, I mean these. You can clearly see on the UI that it's made by developer. <laughs> but jokes aside, Blender is great. Uh, we used it to explore different ideas, to, to try to play with the viewport, how the game is gonna look on mobile, on tablet. And of course we used it for modeling our assets. And another thing that I learned with 3D is that math is cool. I'm not a math guy, I don't have a background in math, I just know the basic, but really 3D makes you understanding that math is cool. So for instance, if we plot uh, random values over time, we get something like this. Not very useful, but if we use an algorithm like Perlin noise, uh, things are, are a little bit more interesting. So we got something which looks more organic and still it feels random. And this algorithm was made by a mathematician called Ken Perlin and actually the algorithm was made for the film Tron for making the special effects. So Perlin noise is just an algorithm, is math, and it can run also on the GPU, so it's really fast and we can use it in 2D or in 3D variant. So we can use it for terrain generation, for example, or we can use it to animate particles. Uh, this is a demo by Edan Kwan and it's using a variation of the Perry noise called Cool Noise. Or we can use it different, like uh, I did for, for a friend, uh, for a website background and here I'm using uh, a, sum, a sum of noise function with different amplitude and intensities and this technique is called uh, fractal Brownian motion 
and uh, seems really complex, but actually isn't. And everything it's done in the fragment shader. There is no geometry, no. It's just a quad, which is a rectangle basically, and we draw everything with the fragment shader. So, very nice. It's really cool, but sometimes it's a bit expensive if you want to use it a lot, and we can actually fake it with simple math. So if we do the sine of x, we do something like this. If we do the sine of x plus cosine of 3x, something a little bit more interesting. And if we do a bunch of sine and cosine with random numbers, we get something which is really interesting and looks really organic and it's hard to see a repeatable pattern. So we could use it for animation or any kind of things. And always talking about math, this is something I made for a design festival in Milan and it's uh, everything it's running on the GPU, it's running WebGL, there is no geometry, there is no uh, vertices, uh, just like, just math. And this technique is super cool. I really think it's super cool. And uh, this was the prototype. On the left, you can see some of the fragment shader. And the technique is called ray marching with distance field. At the core of the technique, uh, there, there are distance functions, which looks like this. So given a 3D point in space, we just need to return the distance from the surface of our object. So for instance, if you want to draw a sphere, we just do the length of P minus the radius. If we want to draw a box, we could we use the other code. I don't know if you can see it on the screen. And if we want to make the intersection between the sphere and the box, we just take the biggest number. So with this technique, we can do a lot, a lot of stuff. And you can have a look on Shader Toy, um, which is a kind of code pen, but for fragment shaders. And believe it or not, this scene is completely made in WebGL by code. There are no 3D objects. It's everything rendering in real time using just math. And there are just uh, 500 lines of code, and the demo is made by Inigo Quillets. And it's pretty impressive. And really, another thing that uh, I learned with WebGL, we really need to be creative, like a lot, uh, especially when it comes to performance. Let's just say we want to have, we want to create, I don't know, a fog effect. We have our square and we need to, to color it. So let's take an image. This is an image made with Photoshop cloud effect and let's draw it on the square. Then we could set our texture as repeat so we could animate it over and over. But it still looks fake, right? The user could see that it's just an image moving on the screen. But if we had just one line of code, things get a little bit more interesting. What we do is we get the same texture a second time, but this time with a little bit of offset. And then we multiply the two values and we got something like this. And it's really hard to spot repeated, repeated patterns here. And if we just change the texture, we can have fog gas-like effect which are really interesting. And actually this technique has been used a lot by Blizzard in the Diablo game. And you can really get a lot of interesting effects and they are super cheap to compute on the graphic cards. Explosions or particles, whatever. Another nice effect where you have to use a little bit of creativity is this one, which is used a technique called spherical environment mapping. So the light on the mesh looks really cool. I mean, if you see the lighting, it looks very dense, very complex, but actually, if you want to make it, it's super easy. So what we do for the lighting is to have a 256 uh, texture, which is actually a little sphere and it's called matte cap or lit cap. And in the fragment shader, just knowing the position of the vertex and the normal vector, we could actually create a kind of raycast that goes 
on the sphere and you use that to color the pixel and we get uh, lighting like this which super beautiful to showcase objects and recently for a project the creative director asked me if it was possible to create this kind of effect which is a kind of mist over a glass so I had to recreate it in WebGL so I'll show you uh, how I did it so on the left we have this scene where we need to apply the effect on the right I have an off-screen scene to to track the, the finger swipes and actually one thing that it's really cool in WebGL we can have what it's called FBO so we can take scene and instead to showing it directly to the, the user we can render it off screen and we can use it for whatever we want so what we do we process those two scenes off screen and then we have a second pass which is the post processing where we get them we get together with a normal map with the drops we had a little bit of blur and uh, some uh, lighting effect, I guess was uh, saturation. And we get that effect, which I think it's really good. And this is running 60 frames per second on mobile. And talking about performance, are really important, I think. Uh, and in fact, if you want to hit an experience at 60 frames per second, you just have 16.6 .6 milliseconds per frame so with that time you need to be ready with a new frame if you want to hit 60 frames per second but not all the devices runs at 60 frames per second they can go lower or higher depending on the screen refresh rate or the CPU GPU load so when you do an animation you have to take that into account so you actually have to calculate a delta based on time so your animation is gonna be the same speed on different on all devices and no matter the refresh rate and actually most of the time the performance bottleneck of a WebGL application is just between the CPU and the GPU uh, talking each other because that is the part that takes most of the time so the GPU alone it's super fast so the less GPU and CPU talk each other, the better. So an example in 3JS, but I'm sure also in other frameworks, we have something like this for changing the rotation, the scale and the position of our object. But what really happens behind the scene is that every time we modify those parameters, 3JS actually need to recalculate the matrix of the object, the transform matrix. So Every time we change that, 3JS need to perform this expensive calculation and this needs to be done for all the scene hierarchy and the result is a 16 float array that needs to be sent to the GPU. So if you have few objects, that's fine, but if you want to animate 1000 objects, that's not gonna happen because you will have a bottleneck between your CPU and GPU. So what you can do is actually skip this part and animate things directly on the shader since we have the full control on it so in this case I'm um, I'm rotating the box we could do that directly in the shader and don't care about the CPU part so another example I don't know if you can see on the screen but uh, there are some snowflakes so this is something we made uh, for a client in collaboration with the Facebook Oculus team and it's a web VR experience and the user starts in the middle of a snowstorm and there are thousands of snowflakes and the only way to achieve this animation is that we animate it on the GPU directly on the fragment shader and this is done with the React VR framework now called React 360 and one thing uh, which is worth mentioning is that actually I was looking into the spec of WebGL and I found out this interesting property called power preference which says that actually when we create the WebGL context we can give a hint to the browser saying if our application is going to be high performance and low performance so yeah let's just always use high performance right? <laughs> 
Uh, this wasn't implemented in 3JS, so I made a pull request that has been accepted, and now it's part of the core WebGL rendering, WebGL render. So we can actually use it. And to be honest, I haven't noticed big differences because it's not clear yet how browser implement this, but appears to be making difference uh, when the system has multiple GPUs, uh, multiple graphic cards, or when it's running into battery saving mode or something similar. And what I was doing for most of my project is that I was always having this full screen canvas with WebGL in the background and I was doing the UI using HTML, or CSS or SVG. But it turns out that that uh, is a really performance issues, especially on mobile. So be that's because our browser internally handles the compositing phase. So what I'm doing right now or trying to do is to make everything full WebGL. So what I have in my HTML page is just a canvas tag and everything it's done in WebGL. Uh, and you can also combine Pixie.js and 3JS and leave them together. And you could use one for the 3D part and the other for the 2D part. So that gave us a lot of performance boost on our games and application, but also opened a lot of interesting scenarios when it comes to the UI inter interaction. You can see on the button here, the over effect, and you can see the dissolve effect, things that you can't do with CSS or SVG, or at least you can't do easily. Uh, the same here on the text, we, are su we have a subtle movement on the text, and actually this is just an image we are applying on a rectangle in WebGL, and then we are adding some kind of distortion effect in the fragment shader. So with a little effort, we can have some nice effect that really makes the difference on your UI. And actually, it's really simple, starting from a 3D position, calculate the 2D position. So actually, your 3D word and the 2D part can be in sync and talk each other. And really, another thing that I learned to reconsider is the usage of textures. Uh, traditionally, the textures are just like images wrapped around a 3D object, and usually those textures are hand painted. And this works very well, but the problem is is that you end up with huge textures, uh, huge amount of file and resolution that is not going to work on mobile devices, especially if you have to draw like entire world or big scenes. So what we experimented in a recent project, uh, what seems to be a good idea is to use uh, gradient maps. So actually in our texture, we create those little boxes made by gradients, and then we map the UV in a way that using those gradients so as you can see here, when I'm dragging the UV coordinates, uh, things get off. And this really allowed us to, to create entire words using just a few pixels of texture. Uh, so we could run those kind of scenarios on mobile in real time. And this not only gave us uh, lots of performance boost, but again, open some interesting creative scenarios. I don't know if you can see it, but in the water, there are like some waves effect, some ripple effect, and we just need four lines of code to achieve that. Actually, what I did is, just, is that now that we use a little gradient box, we know if we are, we are drawing C or not based on the UV coordinate. And then what we do, we just add a little bit of displacement on the UV based uh, on a noise. And we get this effect. And actually with more advanced technique like FBFBO, uh, GPGPU or FBO, we could actually use physics, uh, motion, velocity, uh, everything on the GPU, so you could, in theory, animate millions of objects. So I know for experience that uh, approaching to 3D can be really intimidating at first, and sooner or later you will face things like this, which for me makes totally no sense. Or also with namings, 
it looks that uh, people that work in 3D field, they like give strange naming and really complicated. So most of the time, I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, I'm just a coder, I'm not a mathematician. So what I try to do most of the time is try to steal stuff from other platform and try to learn from other words like game development. And I think it's really important to, to look how other communities do stuff and try to port it on the web. Uh, so about complexity, let me show you an example. This is funk shading, which is a simple lighting model. And this is what you get if you find it on Wikipedia. And now I try to read it several times, but I do not understand it. But actually, if we look at the source code, it's just a line. And now I'm a coder, so I can actually understand it. And then I can just reverse engineer it and understand how it works. So most of the time, things look complicated, but actually they are not. And um, typically, in front-end, most of the cross-browser issues that we have are linked to the browser. So we could actually just test our application in different browser. It runs, okay, perfect, we ship it. With WebGL, it's a bit, little bit different because most of the issues are related to the GPU and performance issues. So there isn't real, a real solution to that. What we do is... We try to test as many devices as possible. And for bigger projects, we use uh, external companies that does two-way gaming tests. And they have like huge device labs. And actually, one of the problem about performance is that since it's web, it's open, everyone can see it. Your application, your game should run on a cheap 100 euro Android device, but also on a 1000 Apple device. So we also expect that on the 1000 device, the graphic is gonna be better, resolution is gonna be better, you are gonna have more, uh, more cool stuff visually. So I tried different things, but actually what, I'm, what I ended up with is it's kind of this. Actually in WebGL there is this cool extension that allow us to know the GPU chipset, the device uh, the user is currently using. Uh, for example, on the device, I have this graphic card, which, by the way, it's real crap. And uh, with that ch uh, chipset information, we could actually compare it with an online benchmark. So once we know that, we could actually have a score for our GPU and for the user device. So what we do is that we change user settings based on that score. It's actually like video games. When you go into settings, you can change the quality of your game. But here we are doing it automatically. So the clients, the user doesn't need to choose the, the, the quality of the game. So it takes some time to, to balance it, to find the right fine tuning but at the end it works. And I agree with you that this is a kind of hack, but right now this is the best solution I've found. And actually, if you look at Google Maps, they're doing the same. It's kind of GPU sniffing. It's like the new user agent sniffing kind of thing. So another thing you can do for performance is to remove the anti-aliasing and use your own implementation of it. Um, I actually prefer it because it gives me more control over the anti-aliasing and it gives more consistency across devices. Uh, let's not forget that there are lots of interesting um, API that we could use in, together with WebGL to make the experience more immersive, like vibration API, like uh, we could use gyroscope and accelerometer, um, we could lock screen orientation, and we can even use GamePad API. And with DevTools, CSS, there are a lot of great tools to debugging, for example, DevTools. But in WebGL, we are a bit disadvantages. Disadvantage too? Okay. Uh, we don't have those tools because it's impossible to have breakpoints in the shaders on the GPU card. So let's see what we can do. One thing that we can do is to add Control Kit or a similar library that actually adds a widget on our website. And with that widget, we can change its values and parameters in real time. And also it's really use useful when we work with the team because we could give that to the creative director or the designer and can help us to fine tuning the visual effects. 
another great browser extension is called Spec uh, Spectre, and it's actually a kind of proxy that sits in the middle of WebGL and API calls. So it logs everything, and we can have a breakdown of our frame and see all the information. And right now, Firefox is the only uh, browser to have a shader editor, so we can actually real-time change the shaders in Firefox. You have to enable it, it's not by default, but it, honestly, it's the only reason I'm using Firefox. <laughs> yeah, and um, if you're using 3JS, there is also this uh, good extension that sometimes it doesn't work, it's not maintained anymore, um, which actually we can change some parameters in real time as well. And uh, there is this website, which is webglstats.com, which is a kind of can I use, but for WebGL. So WebGL looks cool. How do I start if I want to learn it? So I actually learned it in the wrong way, in the sense that I approached directly to a production project and was a kind of mess for me. Um, so what I'm suggesting to you, try in the hard way. Uh, try to learn first how computer graphic works, how 3D works, uh, maybe with Blender, uh, how WebGL, OpenGL works, write tons of shader, success. Uh, some links, RenderHell, which is an introduction guide to computer graphics, um, making stuff look good in Unity, which is a YouTube channel with tutorial on how we create video games effect with shaders. And I made a GitHub list called Awesome Case Study, uh, which lists a series of technical case studies around WebGL world. And to wrap up, I want to show you uh, my recent project uh, we made with Red Bull and Facebook team with the new platform, which is called Facebook Instant Game. We actually launched it yesterday. So it's live, it's still in beta, there are lots of bugs, but if you want to try it out, uh, you just go into Facebook Messenger, Games, and find iDrop Game. Um, and it's pretty cool. And everything is made with open web technologies, HTML5 and WebGL, 3.js uh, and Pixie.js. The total size of the game is less than 5 megabytes, assets, music, textures, um, and we really managed to develop it with a crazy deadline. So, I think that WebGL is here to stay, it's changing mobile gaming industry, 60 frames per second everywhere, it's hard, but it's possible, and it's cool. Thank you.